My name is Noelle. I'm an organizer with Community Alliance for Global Justice. I'm also co-coordinator of Rise Up Summer School, which many of the participants here are from our summer school program. Um, we're going to be opening up this evening with Mentimeter, which as Heather mentioned, is a really cool platform if you've never heard of it. Um, it's super easy. If you pull out your phone or open the new browser tab in your computer, just go to menti.com and put the code at the top of the screen here in order to join the other participants in the couple of questions we're gonna start with. And if you're having any trouble for any reason, feel free to just write your answers in the Zoom chat. It's basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, so as we're gonna be talking about Sam in this evening, I wanted to start off by asking you all to take a moment to bring to mind the waterways with a special place in your heart. Where is that place? Oh, why does it say? Voting is closed. Open voting. Now you can start answering. Okay. Um, for me, there's so many places I can think of. Um, and while today I'm on this call loca located among the Pueblo of Puaque, which is just east of the Rio Grande in New Mexico, this picture is where I would walk and bike from my childhood home along the Sacramento River, home to the southernmost Chinook Salmon Run in North America. Where is your sanctuary? If folks are just joining, welcome. We're starting with um, this tool called Mentimeter. You can open it in a different browser or on your phone at www.meti.com and enter this code 85276444. And if you do that, you can enter a response to this question that's up on the screen. Folks able to answer by chance because I can't see all the. I've answered. Okay. Cool. I can't see it. But yeah, I'm not seeing the responses. Oh, maybe. Excuse my technical difficulties. <laughs> um. I'm not sure what's going on here. Hide image. Oh, there it is. I should have practiced this beforehand. Cool. <laughs> Yuba River, Sutton, South Fork of the American River in Lotus, California. Um, Crane Beach, Ipswich, Massachusetts. Am I saying MA right? <laughs> Columbia River, Wind River, River 2. Sacramento River, Neeson on land, same. Cedar River, Whatcom Creek. Lake Michigan, Caribbean Sea, Venezuelan coast, Spit in Homer, Alaska, Arapaho land in Denver, the South Platte River, Salish Sea, where the Quinault River runs to the Pacific, Toguchi Beach, Clam Flats off the coast of Monomoy Island, located in the north, oh, there it goes. <laughs> Very cool, Lake Washington, oh yes. And so, as some of you already have done, um, that begs the question, do you know the name of the indigenous peoples who have cared for and continue to care for those waters? And if you don't, it's okay to say no. The link in this image, native-land.ca, can be a starting point. For my picture in the last slide, that rivers caretakers have included, as someone mentioned, the Nisanan and Plains Miwok peoples of Northern California. We can take this time to reflect on why it is that we may not know. And to look deeper and ask questions about who has nurtured these places long before we were fortunate enough to be a guest. So we got the Snohomish, we got a yes. <laughs> Might need to click next question. Next 
next question. Are you not seeing it? No, it came up. I just had to click next question. Chinook, Medicine Creek Treaty of 1854 signatories, including the Puyallup tribe. Oh. Rapaho, Nisnan land, Tainos, Guani. Very cool. Quinault. Salish peoples. Thanks, everyone. And as you already know, um, the reason we're beginning with this question today is that for these sanctuaries, we owe the recognition and gratitude to the traditional and continued stewards of all these waters where we live and play. And in a moment here, we're going to be hearing from a couple prominent indigenous leaders in the Pacific Northwest, as well as uprooted and rising organizers about how we can all live in service to the preservation of life, ecosystems and food sovereignty, wherever in the world we may find ourselves. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Heather for intros of our GE Salmon campaign and our panelists. Thank you. Hey everybody. Um, so I am so pleased to be here and thank you Noel so much for that opening. Um, so I'm Heather Day, I'm the Executive Director of Community Alliance for Global Justice and I'm honored to be with you all this evening. Thanks for joining us and I'm really excited to hear from all of our speakers. Um, tonight's event marks our first collaboration on an event with Uprooted and Rising, and I want to thank them for their incredible organizing um, to broaden our GE Salmon campaign and to prepare our movement to take action in the coming weeks. Um, we really needed UNR's infusion of energy and ideas, and I'm really grateful to be collaborating with y'all, both locally and, and nationally. I also want to thank the many organizations who, in, in addition to tribes around the U.S., um, have been leading this work long before we got involved, including Friends of the Earth, um, Center for Food Safety and Earth Justice. And before introducing our speakers, I'm gonna give a bit of background um, just to provide some context. And Sarah is gonna share some slides. Um, just let, giving Sarah a second to pull those up. Are they up there? They are? Oh, okay, I can see them. Great. So our webinar this evening is Black Corporate Salmon Standing with Northwest Tribes for Food Sovereignty. Wild salmon is the most important species in the Pacific Northwest. Um, ecologically speaking, salmon is a keystone species that supports land and water ecosystems throughout our region. And salmon is central to the culture and religion of many native people. And harvesting salmon is critical to maintaining um, indigenous culture as well as our region's economy and well being. And yet, wild salmon runs are being depleted. Um, Northwest tribes, especially, but also our governments are dedicating considerable resources to saving wild salmon. Um, and now, amidst that, we collectively have to face another challenge, and that's genetically engineered salmon. Um, GE, which is short for genetically engineered um, salmon, is the first animal ever anywhere in the world to be approved for human consumption, the first genetically modified animal. Um, and up until this year, the only place that GE salmon had been approved and sold to the public was Canada. But in March of last year, the US Food and Drug Administration, um, the FDA greenlighted green GE salmon for production in the US. Um, there's currently one facility in Indiana and the company is applying to expand to many other states. And they've announced that GE salmon will be sold to the public for the first time in the US next month. So this webinar is part of our efforts to ramp up our campaign. Aquabounty is the company that produces what they call Aqua Advantage Salmon. Um, they first started the development, incredibly, of GE Salmon over 30 years ago. Aquabounty claims that GE Salmon is more sustainable, it's better for the environment, um, it addresses climate changes. However, um, industrial 
aquaculture, also known as farm fish, has many of the same problems as factory farms on land. Um, this includes environmental pollution, disruption to ecosystems, um, it's potentially harmful to human health and definitely much less nutritious than wild caught fish. Um, for humans eating GE salmon, the effects of consuming excess growth hormone are still unknown. And scientists have warned that in some people, consuming growth hormone may activate insulin-like growth factor, which can lead to increased risk of cancer. What happens with genetically engineered salmon is critically important for a number of reasons. Um, first, Northwest tribes have demanded that the U.S. government uphold its treaty obligations. In the Northwest, those of us who are non-native U.S. citizens are treaty partners with Coast Salish tribes who have cared for and sustained the salmon fishery for thousands of years. Um, yet throughout the process of approving GE salmon, the U.S. government has failed to consult tribes or honor their treaty obligations. Um, and especially given the central importance of salmon to indigenous food sovereignty in the Northwest, GE salmon should not have been allowed to be developed or nor should it be allowed to come to the U.S. market. Second, what happens with GE salmon will impact whether we see a flood of new genetically engineered animals on the market. Um, genetic engineers are currently experimenting on dozens of animals, including chickens, cattle, and pigs. There's many fish, including trout, catfish, tilapia, striped bass. Um, they claim that they'll grow faster, have greater muscles, and be disease resistant. Um, thus, it's feared that the approval of GE salmon will open the floodgates to many new products. Um, so civil society has organized a counter GE salmon from the very beginning. Um, we got involved about five years ago um, in 2015. Friends of the Earth um, reached out to CAGJ to engage us in pressure in Costco since they're based here in Seattle. Um, and they had not yet of that, at that point joined about 80 other retailers who had already pledged to not sell GE salmon if it was, if it was approved by the FDA. And after we held several demonstrations that garnered a considerable amount of media attention, Costco finally made a commitment um, and stated that they don't intend to purchase GE salmon at the end of 2015. And it's good to see that their commitment is still on the website today. Um, on September 1st, just recently, Friends of the Earth announced that um, they had reconfirmed this commitment with about 80 grocery retailers, seafood companies, food service companies, and restaurants. Um, that includes more than 18,000 locations nationwide who reconfirmed that they won't sell GE salmon. And this includes Costco, Walmart, Albertsons, um, Kroger, which includes uh, many stores, including Safeway, Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, Sprouts, and Target. So that market campaign has been particularly successful. And two of our speakers tonight took the lead in voicing the opposition of tribes to GE salmon. Um, while working with the Muckleshoot Food Sovereignty Project, Valerie Seacrest led her tribe in passing a resolution opposing GE salmon um, that then went to the statewide level and all the way to the um, National Congress of American Indians, who took a stand in a resolution authored by our other speaker, Fawn Sharp. Um, it was Valerie's passion, and I really like, thank you so much, Valerie, for again joining us tonight um, and just having the vision and really the passion on this issue that is what inspired CAGJ after we led the Costco campaign to continue to work on GE salmon, specifically to amplify the efforts by Northwest tribes to protect our wild salmon. So we've collaborated, collaborated in many ways over the years, including in the projection of our short film, um, Salmon People, the risks of genetically engineered fish for the Pacific Northwest. And we really encourage you to share that widely. Um, at least two other strategies have been pursued. We've kind of tried everything to stop GE salmon. So another one is that, that legislation um, at the federal level that would require labeling of GE salmon if it comes to market was introduced um, years ago by Senator Murkowski of Alaska, and it was co-sponsored by Washington Senator Maria Cantwell. Um, and that we encourage you to tell your Congress people to co-sponsor the Genetically Engineered Salmon Labeling Act. Um, and second, after the FDA approved GE salmon for production last year, multiple organizations brought a lawsuit, and that lawsuit's still making its way through the courts. And President Sharp made the Quinault Indian Nation a party to this lawsuit. And she'll be referring to that, um, to the lawsuit in her comments. Um, I do have an update on that, and it's exciting. There's gonna be a ruling any day now. And in a recent hearing, the judge indicated his tentative position that the environmental assessment 
um, undertaken by Aqua Bounty was not sufficient um, because that, or by the FDA rather, was um, because the FDA failed to do a risk assessment taking into account what would happen if GE salmon were to escape and were to be established in the wild, um, which is a violation, violation of the National Environmental Policy Act. So we're hoping that the judge will require a full environmental impact statement. The judge also indicated concern about whether the FDA can and adequately did determine the GE salmon is safe for the environment as part of the FDA's safe and effective determination for new animal drugs. So we're expecting a ruling, like I said, any day um, that may result in Aqua Bounty not being able to sell salmon from or manufacture in Indiana or import more eggs. And this would really be a major victory, um, not just in terms of GE salmon, but the ruling would be in our uh, in our favor would set a precedent for stronger assessments um, required for future GMO animals. So in summary, this has been a major side of organizing and protests, and yet we still find that most people have not heard of GE salmon. So um, we know that further public education and action is needed, and we really appreciate you joining us tonight to learn more and including um, what we can do about it. So. After our speakers present, they'll, we'll be talking about how to take action on this issue. And we will have time for questions and answers. And we'll wrap up with some announcements at 7.30 um, in about an hour and 10 minutes. So to introduce our speakers, um, Fawn Sharp is president of the Quinault Indian Nation, which is located in Tahola, Washington. The Quinault Indian Nation consists of the Quinault and Quetz tribes and descendants of five other coastal tribes, the Quilut, the Ho, the Chehalis, Chinook, and Cowlitz. And they've st stated that, quote, we're among the small number of Americans who can walk the same beaches, paddle the same waters, and hunt the same lands our ancestors did centuries ago. Um, president Sharp is also president of the National Congress of American Indians. Um, she was elected to that position last year, I believe, and that was founded in 1944 to be a united, unified voice of tribal nations. Um, unfortunately, President Sharp is unable to be with us on the web tonight, webinar tonight, but she did send a short video that we'll be sharing in a moment, um, which we really appreciate. Um, Valerie Seagrass will speak speak after we watch the short video. Valerie is a nutrition educator who has specialized in researching traditional food and medicine systems of the Coast Salish tribes of Western Washington. Um, Val's the first person I've ever heard refer to herself as a food sovereigntist, which I love. Um, she founded Muckleshoot Food Sovereignty Project, which was a grassroots effort and still is, um, toward increasing access to traditional foods within the Muckleshoot community. And she now acts as regional director of Native Food and Knowledge Systems with the Native American Agriculture Fund. Finally, um, Yasmin Ahmed is an organizer with Uprooted and Rising Seattle. They're also associate director of student and community engagement with the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies at the University of Washington. Um, Yasmin is a recent UW grad and graduate of the University of Washington, and was very active in campus social justice organizing, including with Huskies for Food Justice and UW Confronting Climate Change. So with that, I want to thank all of you again for being here with us. And um, thank you, Sarah Lavenhar, our tech guru on this call, for sharing um, President Sharp's video now. Oh, Kiyohutch, Anshak Haiwishka. Good morning, my name is Fawn Sharp. I serve as president of the Quinault Indian Nation and president of the National Congress of American Indians. From the beginning of time, my ancestors here at Quinault fished on the mighty Quinault River and we fished in the ocean. And when we first learned that the FDA approved genetically engineered as fit for human consumption, there was no question and there was no doubt that we were going to enter the lawsuit and defend our sacred prize resource here on the mighty Quinault. When we first started to look at this issue, it was very clear to us that the scientists and the, the scientific studies that formed the basis of the FDA's decision was woefully inadequate. It didn't capture all the risks that we know are out there. And, and finally, and quite simply, it is just plain wrong to think it's possible for man to perfect what God has already perfected in our prize sockeye salmon. And so we had no choice but to enter this lawsuit to defend 
the sacred, to defend our identity. And there are many risks if the FDA continues to do this work without checks and balances, without being held accountable to not applying best science and not having another look. When they determined that there was a finding of no uh, significant impact with the limited science, we have to come together to push back because if they are allowed to let this precedent go forward, what's that gonna do to other future um, engineered products and future engineered uh, animals and plants and all those things that are natural to who we are, our prized resources. And so the Quinault Nation is going to continue to fight the good fight. We are going to continue to urge all those who make decisions, whether it's the FDA or any other permitting agency or entity from the United States. The U.S. is our trustee. They are to look out for our interests not only to tribal nations, but to, to the public at large. And in the time and space where we're at right now in the midst of a global pandemic, in the midst of macro environmental challenges all across this country related to climate change, whether it's the tornadoes and hurricanes in the South, or even the, in, here in the West with a large landscape completely engulfed in flames and megafires, six megafires, in every year consecutively over the last six years. This is a time to embrace science, not to ignore science. And we are going to continue to press and insist that the FDA continue to uphold the highest standards to protect not only Quinault citizens and tribal citizens, but citizens all across this country and consumers throughout the world. Siakwil, thank you. Thank you, President Sharp. Um, I wish she was with us, she's so brilliant. Um, but we are so fortunate to have Valerie Seagrest with us. Val, if you could uh, turn your camera on now, that would be great so we can see you. Hello. Welcome. Hi, can you hear me? <laughs> I can, thank you. Um, Good evening and thank you, Heather, for having me and for carrying this work. Uh, you do it so well. And um, and it's been just like, a, it's just been a really important way to continue moving things forward, especially for us, we're all uh, to speak to Fawn's absence. It's just, we're always, always inundated <laughs> with things to do. Um, and so we really need allies and people who can stay focused on it and um, and stand, stand by us in this work as well. Um, so my name is Valerie Segrist. I'm a member of the Muckleshoot tribe and my background is in nutrition, really. I went to school at Bastyr University and studied um, human nutrition, and then went on to get a graduate degree in food systems and focused really on the Pacific Northwest. And I didn't want to be the kind of nutritionist that sat behind a desk and told my community to eat foods that I knew they didn't have access to in the first place. And so um, that's why we began the Muckleshoot Food Sovereignty Project. And I never thought that I would be working in this kind of arena or um, trying to develop out policy work. So it is, um, it has been quite a journey and I feel like, you know, these kinds of things sort of um, call to you and when you answer them, they take you so far in life. And that's how, for me, um, the teachings of the plant people and, uh, and working with, um, alongside my community to help build out strategies to access our foods and our medicines has, has, um, has been so, such a learning experience for me. And, um, and I, I think about the first time I ever heard Fawn speak and it was actually at Billy Frank Jr.'s funeral. And, uh, and she got up and said, today, the salmon people have lost a really good friend. And, uh, and that those words echo to me, um, deep down into my spirit. And I, and I think about how we are, our work is really to show up in these spaces and advocate for people, for the things, the people, the salmon people who don't have a voice. And, um, 
And so just plain and simple, you know, some, some of the reasons to just reiterate what people have talked about kind of already is that this, this, uh, this product um, being pushed into our market for the sake of, of what they're calling food security has actually never been done before, that this is the first genetically engineered animal species that would be released into our food infrastructure. And that obviously there's been limited, very, very minimal research. And, um, and really, if you have a good product, you know, you'd be excited to do some research and brag on it, but that just doesn't seem to be the case, or so they're saying, after $140 million invested into this and over 20 years of development, to have limited research is really hard to believe. Um, and that there is no guarantee that this, this uh, Frankenfish can, cannot reproduce, really. Um, we see that time and time again here in our waters that we're told the, uh, the farm fish are not able to produce, uh, reproduce, but I know fishermen, I've, I've had testimony from fishermen who have said that they have gutted these fish and seen um, plenty of eggs inside of them. Uh, there's limited transparency. In fact, what transparency we do have, uh, groups like this and the, the partners and the coalition that has formed to advocate for this have fought really hard for. Um, it's detrimental to our fish economy. And I feel kind of like, isn't that really an ironic uh, thing to point out <laughs> in the age of, you know, COVID and Zoomlandia, where we're all um, we're all experiencing a, a severe disruption in our food systems infrastructure. It has been, um, I think, the silver lining of it all, very illuminating in the major issues that we have in, uh, in the cracks and the gaps of our, um, our food infra infrastructure and how um, really vulnerable it truly is. Uh, po probably the most annoying reason to me is that it's not actually very nutritious. It is, uh, it is the, uh, the product is 33% pr less uh, healthy, like contains less healthy fats than um, wild salmon does. So it's sort of like capitalizing on the legacy of uh, a cultural keystone species that my ancestors and my, uh, my, husband right now is actually out fishing uh, salmon in Lake Washington. That is, um, that's something that we've organized our lives around for so long. And it's just really disrespectful to sort of capitalize on, you know, the legacy of the nutrition and good medicine that salmon carries. And um, Heather mentioned this already, there are several health hazards uh, that could produce cancer in the body that lead to that. And, um, and possibly the most alarming to me is that salmon, you know, that genetic patent that's on it would it now means that some company um, owns a Chinook salmon and uh, a gene of that. And that is just really, um, really devastating. So, you know, many countries employ what is called the, the precautionary principle, which simply means that when uncertainty is likely to persist, it is our human duty to emphasize the need for research that contributes to strength of the evidence of plausible health effects. And we simply do not know enough about GE salmon to introduce it into our food system and operating by any other way puts humans, the environment, many species and uh, several layers of our economy at risk. So it especially puts tribal communities at risk. You know, we are a fishing culture. And since time immemorial, we've organized our lives around salmon. So our ancestral wisdom tells us that when the salmon are gone, everything else will disappear. And we understand that the salmon return to the rivers to feed the waters, the land, the trees, the plants, the animals, and us humans. So what happens when GE salmon escape or interbreed with our ancestral salmon? What happens when they're introduced into the market without transparency? What happens physically to our bodies? We are all part of that science experiment all of a sudden without our consent, without passing an ethical review, research review board. It's kind of like so many other issues that are happening right now in our world. So um, I just, I, I uh, 
am so grateful that so many of you have showed up to hear and learn more and um, and understand this crazy uh, time that, that we're in on top of all that, all that's going on in the world. Um, we're going to be seeing GE salmon hit our shelves as soon as the as soon as next month. So um, the good news is several supermarkets have have uh, have agreed to not sell it. They, there is no assurance that they won't fall in line, but it looks like um, you know we, we've just got to keep going strong and making sure that we do the best we can to be. Um, a friend to the salmon people who give their lives for us to have life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie. And always appreciate what you bring your leadership in this in this work. Um, and now I'd like to invite Yasmin to share really exciting work that Uprooted and Rising is doing, putting this work into a really amazing broad context and organizing locally and nationally. If you could turn on your camera, Yasmin, that would be great. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Um, and hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for making the space for us. And thank you to Heather and CAGJ for hosting this event um, and bringing all of us together to talk about this really critical issue. I want to start with a quick summary of what UNR does and how we initially got plugged into all of this work around protecting salmon that CAGJ and many other groups um, have been engaged with for many years. And of course that coastal native communities and salmon protectors have been doing since time immemorial. Um, Uprooted and Rising is a network of supermajority black and indigenous people and um, people of color who aim to end higher education support for big food corporations and white supremacy in the food system uh, and direct the energy of our generation towards food sovereignty. Our goals revolve around mobilizing young people to solicit their involvement with the struggle for food sovereignty and work for solutions in their communities. We particularly focus on higher education because we think that it's a strategic way to engage young black and brown people to confront these institutions until or unless they end their support for big food and begin to meaningfully address the capitalistic and white supremacist frameworks they operate under that diminish the knowledge of indigenous communities, black communities and communities of color. Higher education has always been a pervasive force and um, one with the power to influence and control popular research and knowledge, and oftentimes serves as a gatekeeper to opportunities and resources. It plays a huge role in influencing future jobs and future public policy, which though in theory is not necessarily bad and potentially beneficial for society, it often diverts its attention away from the communities that its students, staff, and faculty represent. Uh, and rather as an entity chooses to partner with corporations to amplify their goals, meaning that the university often operates primarily as a business. It's unfortunate because there's often incredible research and activism that takes place on university campuses, but many of the projects that receive the most funding at a university are those that generate the most profit. Universities up uplift the goals of capitalism and white supremacy by using their enormous purchasing power to buy goods and services from massive corporations instead of nearby communities. So in short, higher education, one, buys billions of dollars worth of big food products, two, promotes big food brands through contracts and named buildings, and three, funnels students into corporate jobs and uses public resources in the case of public universities to develop lucrative technology and intellectual property that is adopted by big food and then passed on to state, national, and foreign policy. Also, sorry if you can hear my cat in the background. She's trying to climb a ladder. Um, that <laughs> Love to hear your cat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so this campaign around blocking genetically engineered salmon from reaching our, from reaching our mar markets is something that you and I started to become involved with in October of 2019. We were invited to a meeting with Dana from Friends of the Earth, um, as well as Heather from CAGJ um, and Brett from NAMA, which is Northwest Atlantic Marine Alliance and a few others at a, after a local catch summit in Oregon. 
all of these organizations were organizations that UNR had been in relationship with for years at that point. Uh, and at that meeting, we learned that C grant universities, which are higher ed institutions that receive federal funds and resources for marine research and education, are actually one of the biggest promoters of genetically engineered salmon, as well as commercial offshore aquaculture, which rather than promoting ocean conservation efforts, which is one of the mandates of the Sea Grant College, uh, instead puts it at huge ecological risk and endangers our community's health and safety. And so we wanted to offer our energy and capacity and the UNR network to throw our weight behind the efforts to block GE salmon and the expansion of commercial aquaculture. When we learned that Aqua Bounty um, was planning to release GE Salmon this year, we connected with indigenous folks and organizations that have been invested in this issue for years to get some guidance around how to best take on a role around student and broad community organizing to stop this release. Um, but planning our actions to stop the release of GE Salmon kind of turned into a strange back and forth waiting game because Aqua Bounty kept changing its release date to the next couple of months and the next couple of months after that. Uh, but fortunately, that gave us a lot of time to bring more people together, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous folks from across the country, to shape the narrative, the strategy, and most recently, the plan to take action. Uh, so I'm also realizing that I didn't really take a, an opportunity to introduce myself very thoroughly, um, and it might be a, a bit of bad form to do it so far in, but I think an introduction now might help add a little bit more context. So I work as a staff member at the University of Washington, like Heather mentioned, and prior to that, I attended the UW for my bachelor's. Uh, and something I learned through this campaign, which was not at all surprising, is that the University of Washington is one of the most influential, if not the most influential, Sea Grant University in the US. Uh, it works in partnership with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, which is a federal agency that is part of the US Department of Commerce to produce marine slash ocean related research, as well as develop marine technologies. And with the funding they've gotten as a sea grant, they have produced a ton of research around improving offshore aquaculture. Um, in fact, the UW has an aquaculture research center with, that has a pretty capitalistic mission statement, if you read it. And if you're interested to know what it is, please ask me in the Q&A. Um, uh, as well as some lukewarm research around the environmental impacts of it. You know, nothing too strong enough to suggest that giant aquaculture companies shouldn't get the green light. Um, they are helping support the problem, and that's such a shame. Uh, the positionality that I hold here as someone who's been a part of this institution for so long is a huge part of why I chose to organize with UNR, which aside from believing in and fighting for food sovereignty is to demand more from higher education. The University of Washington, just like many others, is a monolith. Uh, I can tell you about countless fights and campaigns I have been a part of at the UW that existed long before I joined them and still continue to exist unresolved. The majority of people that are honored with buildings and streets named after them on our campus are billionaires and colonizers. And the UW exists on Duwamish and Coast Salish land, and yet the main street that runs through the UW is named after Isaac Stevens, a man who worked to forcibly colonize this land. And so, the university's administrative and bureaucratic processes are designed to stall the change that is demanded by student activists as much as possible. And oftentimes the university tries to work changes that they are forced to make into their image to uplift themselves for progress had and no more needed. The capitalist white supremacist framework that exists as the foundation of the university seems unshakable at times. Uh, and they have so much power, uh, but they don't have any power without their students, staff, and faculty. They don't have any power without the communities that come and fill their walls, and also now their virtual walls. Um, it can exist without us, and despite their strategic evasion, we have to, and we will confront them and make them change. And as a powerful Sea Grant University, their stance matters, um, and we are working to demand that they support the communities that they claim to serve. 
And finally enough, despite all of the things I've been saying about the university, I've actually developed an interest in going to graduate school. Um, when we began doing our own investigations into GE salmon and commercial offshore aquaculture, I learned some things that really painted the picture for me of the huge corporate web that dominates the seafood industry. So my homeland is Thailand. I am half Thai, half Pakistani, and I grew up in Thailand. And earlier this year, I had planned to return home to visit family, but also to follow up with some threads of research I was coming across through this campaign. And this really is a web, so <laughs> stay with me or humor me for a little bit. Um, so Chicken of the Sea and Bumblebee Tuna are two incredibly recognizable seafood brands in the US. Um, both of those companies are owned by a Thai company known as Thai Union Group. And in 2015, an Associated Press investigation uncovered a series of human rights violations connected to the group, including using child labor in processing plants, deplorable working conditions, and human trafficking, including slavery at sea. Um, migrant workers on the coast would be tricked or coerced onto fishing boats and not allowed to leave. Some wouldn't touch land for years. Those who were sick were thrown overboard and workers were forced to labor up to 22 hours a day, were abused, were locked up if insubordinate. They claimed, Thai Union Group has claimed, to have cleaned up their act since then, but I was curious to try and see for myself how much of that was actually true and what investigations have been done since then. And I spoke to my mom, who everyone on this webinar should know is a fantastic person, um, about my intentions. And she told me that her brother, an uncle I have never had the chance to meet, was a coastal worker and that he disappeared a little over 10 years ago. And no one really knew what happened to him or has heard from him since. And of course, I don't know, but I have a guess. Um, now, it's been a while since I first heard that and I wasn't able to return home because of COVID. Um, but the web is not complete yet, so for now, let's keep going. Uh, Thai Union Group is currently expanding their operations. Um, and it's part of this global initiative called CBOS, which stands for Seafood Business for Ocean Stewardship which claims to be a group whose ambition is global transformation towards sustainable seafood production and a healthy ocean. Um, in this group, along with Thai Union Group, who again was busted for human trafficking violations, is a company named Cargill. And Cargill is the largest private company in the United States and their main trade is actually soy, not seafood. Uh, Cargill, along with other companies such as JBS, are the primary actors that are burning down the Amazon rainforest. So far, 17% of the Amazon has been burned and cleared to make room for agriculture. Um, on Cargill's part, massive soy monocultures. And they have plans to continue that work, even though research has shown that once 25% of the Amazon has been burned, the forest will not be able to replenish itself. I can't even begin to describe the impacts on climate change on the native communities that regard the Amazon as their home. It is doubtful that either Cargill or Thai Union Group are in this work to act as stewards for a healthy ocean. So why is Cargill part of CBOS and why is it producing all of this soy? Well, it poses soy as the future of fish feed. Cargill is one of the primary actors actually in the aquaculture industry, fighting and lobbying to make it so that giant aquaculture companies can expand into federal waters far into the ocean, which is the last public commons, so that it can provide feed for all of them, all of the aquaculture companies. Uh, Cargill is also currently a source of feed for aqua bounty and genetically engineered salmon. Um, even with all of this, the web of, of destruction is still incomplete, but the mission of the companies involved is pretty clear, which is profit. Profit, regardless of the impacts that it has on independent companies, workers, or communities. And I am in this fight because I care about the communities of the people I organize with, because I care about my family, because we all have a stake in the outcome of this. 
We all have a stake in the global impact this has on countries that are first in line to receive this new wave of colonization through genetically engineered animals and mass commercial offshore aquaculture. More immediately, we have a responsibility to be an active solidarity with the original stewards of this land, of coastal tribes whose land I occupy by living in Seattle and in the Pacific Northwest. Our intention and the role we are trying to play as UNR in this issue is to work with Native people, youth, and Native youth to take coordinated action around the release of GE salmon and the expansion of industrial aquaculture into the ocean and to address the involvement of Sea Grant universities and hold them accountable. We are still building our team and are committed to building deeper relationships with each other. And since February, we have been having national calls with mostly BIPOC folks from Washington, California, Massachusetts, New York, Indiana, and Florida, who are willing to mobilize around this issue. And I am super grateful to be a part of this campaign. I've really learned so much um, since I started. Um, I have met a bunch of organizers through this across the United States who have gone hard on research with me, who have um, taught me a lot about what it means to build relationships with each other. Um, we've been learning about protocols as well on these calls for building meaningful relationships with Indigenous folks and Indigenous leaders. Um, so it has been such an amazing, incredible learning experience to be um, on this campaign and working with people who have been a part of this for so long, who have so much guidance to offer. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to, to be continuing this work and um, helping offer our energy towards this. And uh, I guess to close, um, to share a piece of the narrative that drives our work, um, we uplift that food reflects how our communities have learned to survive and thrive throughout the ages. Beyond providing us with physical sustenance, food is often our greatest tie to culture, community, and the earth. While growing, eating, and sharing food can be some of the most meaningful community experiences of our lives, the food system is also the source of some of the most damaging injustices that affect our people. But the mainstream story about food either hides or normalizes these harms. We are effectively told that if we want food to be affordable, then we must accept exploitation in the fields, in processing plants, and in food service jobs. We are told that if we want to feed a growing world, then we must accept agricultural methods that destroy our topsoil, pollute our water, degrade animals, and leave farmers and fishers poorer than ever. While corporate food industry executives get richer, their workers struggle to feed themselves, pay their medical bills, care for their families and communities, and survive. And this is because our current food system places a higher value on profits and corporate control than on human health, dignity, and the right to be nourished by and connected to land, culture, and community. Um, quickly before uh, we go into Q&A in the next section, I wanted to share that we have a form where you can sign up to support or organize with us in this campaign. And I just want to share what that link is uh, really quickly. It's bit.ly or bit.ly forward slash UNR Ocean. Um, we are organizing actions across the country in all the states I mentioned before, which are Washington, California, Massachusetts, New York, Indiana, and Florida. So if you come from any of these places, we really need you. And we have a variety of asks and needs for support that you can tap into, uh, including graphic design, press, writing, logistics planning. Um, even if you come from other places or places other than the states I mentioned, social media a huge part of connecting folks to this issue. Um, so please still fill out the form and we'll do the work on our part to connect with you and designate roles. But yeah, thank you so much for offering us the, the space to speak. Um, and we're really excited to be working with everyone and connecting with everyone and building relationships with people. Thank you. That deep and broad. Um, presentation, yes, me, and I'm very personal too. I really appreciate it. Um, we want to invite everyone now to, if you're comfortable um, sharing your video, and especially our speakers, Yasmin and Valerie, um, since there are questions from folks. Um, and
and Noelle is kind of moderating and leading organizing the, of the questions in chat. So Noelle, if you wanted to join with your video as well, that would be great. So we encourage folks to share um, questions in the chat and then we can also have folks raise their hand either using the raise hand function of Zoom or literally raising your hand. Um, we can get started with one question that was in the chat earlier. Um, do you believe, and anyone can feel free to answer this if you too, um, do you believe that there is any place for aquaculture? Is there a way it can be put forth in a sustainable way? Smaller aquaculture organizations? Valor, Yasmin, feel called to that question. Hi, um, I don't know if I, I know that I brought up um, aquaculture in my presentation, but I was wondering if Valerie had anything to share on it first, um, but I can offer um, like a short response on it as well. Can you reread the question? I just want to make sure I'm in my mind. I'm like maybe getting off base. Sure. Do you believe that there is any way, any place for aquaculture? Is there a way it can be put forth in a sustainable way? I think that people uh, have been actually doing aquaculture sustainably for thousands of years. I mean, muckle shoots are not, have, and this is for all tri all tribes that are in the Northwest. We had, you know, infrastructure in place. We had certain net sizes. We had fish chiefs that would make sure that certain amount of fish would go, get up to do spawning. Um, if there was fingerlings that were struggling in a certain area, they were carried around in elk bladders to other areas. The, the idea of managing a fishery has never been hands off. It's just our American cultural pattern that thinks that and our mental model that thinks that. So aquaculture has been done very sustainably for thousands of years. Um, and, it, and it's not just a popular, like, yes, there is a population and a demand and a global economy issue, but it's really about um, <clears throat> like, like I've heard people say, um, we know what it will take to save the salmon. We just lack the will to do it. And there's a very um, imbalanced algorithm out there that, that uh, manages it at this time and um, very gentrified research methods that uh, do not include people who've been managing fisheries for a very long time that still are here fishing and advocating. Um, it's just a really mismanaged system. And the, the response right now is just to respond with like racist keyboard courage behind these ridiculous articles about anytime the word fish, fishing, salmon comes up in the Seattle Times, it's gross to read the comments. Um, even like we, one of the fishery cookouts that we'd had uh, for this event, Heather, um, and we brought, I brought, you know, tribal members out to, um, to do a fish cookout to raise awareness about this. And the story that was put up online had horrible comments in, in the boxes. And those two people are precious to me, you know, they're, um, without going too far into their, the details of their life, like they're, they're healing and they're on the right side of their healing story. And I would never meant intentionally to put them out in the public so that they could be smeared because somebody has their, their wires crossed and has a tremendous amount of misinformation and then decides to get online and just attack people. But the, in, the inherent biases in it are, are the problem. Um, I mean, just simply a corporation, just simply thinking it's okay to um, own uh, genetic, genetic material of 
<laughs> you know, like, wow, that's, that's crazy entitlement, but that sums up how aquaculture is dealt with here in, in this era. And, um, and I think it just starts with that. So yeah, aquaculture can totally be um, managed in a good and sustainable way. I'll get off my rant now. Sorry. I'm sorry. Jasmine, did you <laughs> love your rants well. Jasmine, did you want to add anything? Um, yeah. Um, so uh, just coming from the perspective of UNR, um, I think that our main um, I t like totally agree with what Valerie said about aquaculture having been done sustainably for a really long time um, and how um, some like some native communities um, use aquaculture and use hatcheries as a way to help sustain their ecologies as well, because in some locations, the salmon can't reproduce, reproduce fast enough um, as fast as they are um, dying as well. Um, and so hatcheries help um, restore that ecology. And so there's um, definitely aquaculture that exists that um, helps sustain those ecologies um, and have been used. Um, very sustainably, as Valerie said. And I think that the sort of aquaculture that we're referring to and kind of like the web of, of Cargill um, and um, like international aquaculture um, and mass aqu aquaculture is kind of just the more commercial level corporate aquaculture um, that is, is done in a way that does not ask the consent of native communities um, is done in a way that um, is dangerous and compromises on worker safety, um, on environmental safety, um, that has resulted in fish escapes as well that have been really damaging um, to both the ecosystem um, and are things that Native communities have had to respond to. I know even in the, the Pacific Northwest here, there was a, a Cook aquaculture fish escape um, that resulted in over a hundred or over eight hundred thousand um, dollars in costs for the Lumi Nation that responded to this and declared a, a state of emergency, um, having to catch all of the fish that escaped from the the net pen collapse from Cook Aquaculture. Um, so yeah, absolutely, totally um, agree and. Um, yeah, I think that our, our main focus is kind of on the bigger uh, companies that are not doing aquaculture sustainably. Thank you both. Um, we have one more question. Well, more than one. <laughs> uh, how do the speakers continue to make space for their sanity and wellness in this work when we are all facing large challenges like mentioned above I don't know as well the many challenges yeah. I don't know if I said that clearly <laughs> how, how do you guys stay um, sane make space for your sanity and wellness among all this work and everything else that's going on that's like the theme of my day today, to be quite honest. I think I talked to Heather earlier. <laughs> yeah. It's like, um, you know, <clears throat> I was I was asked by someone earlier, uh, what like share with us some of the successes that you've been watching happen in in your organization um, throughout this time, this pandemic, and. I and and I was in a group of people and everyone was sharing about how cool it is that we pivoted to technology and we're still connected and all that stuff and I I'm not sure that that's a success yet. I'm not sure that this is actually a sustainable way of living and in the short term it's great but we're 6 months into it and it's um this is not how I'm designed as a human to stare at myself on a screen all day. It's very difficult to like if we were all together in person I'd be able to feel what you're feeling or kind of get an you know empathic connection to how you're receiving this information and right now my mind is working on overtime to figure out like do you hate it do you love it you know it's just it's exhausting and taxing and so the best thing that we can do and this is what we all sort of walked out of the meeting promising ourselves well clicked off the meeting promising ourselves to be for each other is, is to 
let remind ourselves that it's okay. It's okay to take a break. It's okay to say that we can't be on that Zoom call right now because we feel like we're going to be insane if we do it. <laughs> so um, there's that. And for me, you know, it's just unplugging. And I spent the weekend fishing. I was out in Elliott Bay with my partner um, harvesting and watching him. He's been fishing since he could walk. And he's just this incredible um incredibly wonderful at what he does it's in his genes it's it's what he's been bred to do and it's so clear um watching him do that that to me is is the true remedy and um and so for me staying sane means just making sure to take a break go outside get off of this machine <laughs> be aware that we might be getting trapped by it and that you know there are algorithms here that are definitely polarizing people intentionally and that's not okay and cool at all um and and yeah just to help like we need to strengthen our stitch and not continue to pull threads apart we worked so hard to weave things together and to leave something for future generations to have and i i don't know i i would never forgive myself if I left this world and my children, grandchildren didn't know what salmon fishing was like or tastes like. That's um, a, a complete cultural collapse for us. Uh, you know, our, our, our stories say that when the, the salmon cease to exist, so do we as a people, that we may be here on this land and move and breathe, but we'll be nobody without our fish. And so um, that's important because we are all in an identity crisis at all times in this country. <laughs> and, and I need my children to know who they are and where they come from. And that eating their, eating that salmon, that ancestral food is what activates their DNA and, um, and helps them stay grounded in who they are and where they come from. But um, so for me, I'm both fueled by it, but I have to check myself and make sure I, I take a break. Thanks for sharing that, Val. Yasmin, did you want to respond to the question as well? Um, sure. I think that Valerie's res response was incredible and I resonated with so much of it, um, especially like the piece about like being very fueled by this work, but also like really needing to be mindful of all of the energy that I'm spending on it and all of the, the time. I mean, like both like trying to support ourselves materially in the, like in our lives, um, like going to work and um, paying rent and all of these things that seems so hard to think about when we're tackling all of these really huge issues. Um, and then also like wanting to put all of this energy and time into organizing and building relationships and not letting um, like relationships um, fade, even though it's it's much harder to navigate now during the pandemic when relationships feel weird, work feels weird, everything it feels like a new way that we're navigating um, kind of through this like virtual realm, uh, navigating isolation and um, like Valerie said too, like kind of like feeling like all of the pressure of these algorithms kind of um, putting pressure on our identities as well um, and trying and having that kind of like isolation and alone time and uh, wrestling with all of that. So I, I really resonate with everything that, that Valerie said. I think it's, it's really hard. I truly believe in all this work. I'm so happy to be connected to it and happy to be connected um, to the people who are, who are organizing around this and believe in this and believe in, in food as more than just sustenance as food, um, being like a source of community and culture and history. Um, I really, I'm really grateful to be surrounded by that, but also definitely needing to pull away from the screen sometimes, um, needing to, to actually like take care of like material things and mental health things um, and connecting with one another um, as well on a more personal level outside of organizing work and work work as well. So yeah, I really appreciated all of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Beth. Um, here's an interesting question. Um, 
Should we eat, be eating salmon at all, especially considering it is the only food source for the southern resident orcas whose numbers are dwindling? Um, I'm wondering if I should, uh, <laughs> I'm going to eat salmon for sure <laughs> because I'm designed to do it and, um, to eat that food. It is, and I think we have to be careful when we make those kinds of statements because I know 74 fishermen that are, you know, that are personal family friends of mine from my community that um, have no other way of making an income. This is their life. The, you know, we're it's like saying, let's stop eating all the beef. Uh, <laughs> like all, all Americans stop eating beef. You know, um, all there, there would be a huge hit to an economy and a certain um, family tradition that has been or bison ranching or anything, you know, when, whenever you start, uh, we have to be careful to not attack a certain food source, knowing that there are economic disruptions behind it. So um, I just know that I've, I've heard Louis say that in meetings, uh, my partner, that when you say you're not gonna eat any more Washington salmon, that means that our fisheries industry, which is already not very, well functioning um, takes a, a major hit. And, you know, the only other job opportunities that those fishermen would have um, in our community because of the economic um, invisible embargoes that are all around our reservation are, you know, working at a poker table or behind a desk. And that's not, again, what they were designed to be. Um, I couldn't imagine Louie not not ever fishing in his life. It's just what he does. It's what he was put here to do. So I, I would just be caught. I would say, be, let's be cautious about saying things like that. But um, limiting our consumption, yes, definitely. Do you want to add on to that, Yasmin, or do you want to move on? Uh, I don't think I have anything to add. That's great. Um, I just wanted to ask Brett, who's here with Northwest Atlantic Marine Alliance, or um, Amy Van San, who's here with Center for Food Safety. Um, John, you just posted, um, John's a farmer with Family Farm Defenders. I'm, I'm thinking about the connections between um, food sovereignty organizing amongst farmers and farm workers on the land and, and food sovereignty organizing amongst fishers. And I know NAMA does a lot of work on that. Um, the National Family Farm Coalition and NAMA have a strategic partnership um, to try to bring together those struggles. Um, and I, I just wonder if, um, if someone might wanna uplift th that organizing. There's also Tipo here, I just realized from, um, one of our Canadian allies doing organizing around GE Salmon. Um, I'll give it a shot. Hey, Heather, everybody. Um, first of all, huge appreciation to Valerie and Yasmin and Heather for putting this together. Um, just real quick, yeah, so Brett, I'm a, the National Program Coordinator with NAMA and just a quick response. I you know, our, our work is very much about connecting what Heather just laid out, that the struggle and the history of family farming is very directly connected to that similar struggle when it comes to fishing communities. And so a lot of our work has been connecting those same dots at the way we treat our lands is so much about the way that we are as a people and similarly the way that we treat our ocean and waterways it says so much about who we are as a people. And so to the extent that we can, we've been um, building those bridges between the lessons learned and the history and context of food grown on land with how it's showing up on our ocean. Um, and just one very broad aspect of our work that I think stands out 
is this issue around privatization that um, you know since the time of colonialism the privatization of land has resulted in so many of the problems that we see showing up um, that's an understatement <laughs> but it's very core to issues around gentrification in cities and the displacement of people in farming lands um, and up until now in many respects the ocean and our waterways has still remained a public commons that has at least some levels of democratic participation and is about of and for and by, managed by and for and of the people however in the past couple of decades there's been significant moves to start to privatize areas of the ocean privatize uh, fisheries access um, in the forms of quota the current policy vehicle for this is called catch shares. And so we've been really just kind of linking those connections as well. If we've learned anything from some of the problems that have developed over a long time on land, we really need to pay attention to these moves toward privatizing the ocean and our waterways. So we organize around it. We'd love to, you know, call attention to any folks who want to get involved to visit our website, hit us up on social media. Um, yeah, we're you know, part of this work, um, I think as Jasmine kind of touched upon it, that in the, the bigger picture of what we're kind of fighting against is related to this corporate takeover element of the ocean that is, is centered around privatization. So we love what UNR is, is bringing to all this work. Um, and just again, yeah, appreciation for this webinar. Thanks for giving me space. Thanks, Brett. Um, Yasmina Valerie, did either of you want to respond to that, to what Brett was sharing or? It's fine if not. <laughs> well, this is John, I could, I could share a little bit because um, Family Farm Defenders was founded actually about out of an anti-GMO struggle because we were the first organization to, to realize that uh, bovine growth hormone was being developed at, at UW-Madison. So, I mean, one of the principles of food sovereignty is that no life form should be privatized or patented. So, I mean, for us as farmers, it makes total sense that GE salmon is a horrible idea and should not be allowed. I mean, we're against all forms of patenting of life forms, whether it's wild rice. Here in, in Minnesota, they're trying to patent wild rice right now against the wishes of native people. We have GE animals of all sorts. And of course, you know, plants. So, I, I mean, I guess we, we believe all life is common property it's it's for everyone to, to share no one can own it so i mean I, that's what i mean that's where like a lot of farmers resonate with fishing folks on, on that level they care about their animals they care about their plants no corporation should own it thank you john <laughs> i love it i feel like that's my work right now is just like hey farmers ranchers fishermen harvesters we're all we're all in this together and you're right it's not anybody's to own, it's our job to take care of it um, collectively as consumers of those things. <laughs> yeah, we should care for that. Thank you. Um, do folks have questions about the lawsuit? I, Amy, I would love it if you give a quick, uh, just, indication of like does it feel like we're on the verge amy von is with center for food safety i think is lead counsel yeah amy on this um just it feels like maybe we're on the verge of a victory for once and <laughs> i would just love for you to kind of put into perspective what what might happen with the lawsuit i don't want to get people's hopes up too much but yeah sure and th thank you for giving me a little space here too apologies for being in a car <laughs> um <laughs> because a little bit of last minute joining, but uh, I am I'm one of the counsel in the case. I had the privilege of um, doing part of the argument um, a couple weeks ago, and you know, uh, as well as uh, other attorneys with Center for Food Safety and, and Earth Justice, and we've been litigating it for four plus years now. And so this is the culmination of a lot, lot of hours and effort to challenge what you described as correctly is this really novel monumental approval, the first ever GE animal for human consumption. Uh, by FDA. So not only does it dictate whether or not this specific salmon is going to be allowed to be sold in the U.S., you know, or have to go through further review, it also is, you know, what FDA can do in the future, because as 
John just mentioned, you know, there's other GE animals out there that are in research that are coming down the pike, you know, um, pigs or chickens that um, can fit into the factory farm model and fit into that industrialized model, um, you know, as opposed uh, to um, their natural, you know, behaviors. So it's really important what, what happens with the court. And we really hope that the, that the judge will rule on that issue of whether the environmental impacts need to be considered when FDA is doing its safe and effective, you know, drug evaluation. And um, like you said, you know, it seemed like the judge, and he said, you know, that his tentative um, feeling was that FDA failed to do a proper risk assessment as it's required to do. It didn't look at what would happen if the salmon escaped. And we know with, aqu with aquaculture, escapes are inevitable. So even though right now Aqua Bounty is using these land-based facilities, they're not impenetrable. And they're certainly not um, you know, immune from human error or accidents, um, climate change, bringing more floods and storms and things of that nature. So the concern here is that the fish will get out and that they will have effects on wild salmon populations. And we also know that this approval of just these limited facilities on Prince Edward Island and in Indiana now um, is just the foot in the door for the company. And they have said that they want to grow 50,000 tons of salmon a year is their goal. Right now they can they have the capacity for a couple thousand tons a year. So they are looking to greatly expand. And that is a you know, significant percentage of the farm salmon market. And uh, no farm salmon is sustainable in, my, in our view. Um, the, all the problems with aquaculture, I think we're already kind of touched on of that type of industrial aquaculture, not, not the other kinds of, of management. So it is a broad term, but uh, when we say aquaculture, we mean the industrial side. So, um, you know, CFS will be updating everyone as soon as we know what happens with the case. And so we encourage you to, you know, sign up for our, our alerts if you haven't yet. And, uh, and uh, we're really hoping it'll happen soon and it'll go our way. Thank you. Thanks for all of your work on it. It's such important side of the, of the campaign. Um, and wouldn't it be amazing if a judge ruled in our way? <laughs> in our, uh, we still one. need the organizing though. <laughs> that's really, yeah. really important. And getting all those commitments from, from uh, retailers not to sell it, that's, that's a huge piece. So thank you all for your work on it. Yeah, Amy, um, someone's asking about getting alerts about the case from Center for Food Safety. There's probably a way to sign up for that on the website. Yeah, there's all sorts of I think we're all the organizations. I was posted their uh, URLs in the chat and we'll email out every way to get information um, after this webinar as well. We'll contact everybody who's on it. Um, but if you wanted to share anything specific. Uh, just our action alerts would be the best way. Yeah. Great. Well, um, I think um, Sarah, if you wouldn't mind sharing the take action slide, uh, which is the last slide of the, um, yeah. So thank you so much. Um, so Yasmin, you might wanna to speak to this a bit more, but we wanted to take a minute to ask everyone to open this bit.ly link right now. Just do it. We wanna take a minute to have you just go ahead and Click on that, and that is a way to um, let Uproot and Rising know with whom we're collaborating that you want to be involved in some way in, in taking action. And they will definitely be in touch um, to help mobilize folks. And I mean, there's, you know, this is threatened to come uh, to market and, you know, in the coming weeks and there are actions planned around the country. Um, a lot of work going into that right now, including here in Seattle. Um, I'm really excited about the possibility of, of doing something similar to what we did um, for our, if anybody came to our action for the 20th anniversary of the WTO protest, we painted a big, beautiful mural in the streets of downtown Seattle um, about supporting the Green New Deal. Um, and that just was an effective way of bringing folks together to do, do, you know, make art together that also sends a really clear message. Um, so we're excited about doing some creative actions here and also around the country. So I don't know if, Yasmin, you want to share the specific places again that you're organizing, although I think 
no matter where you are in the country or world, if you can take the minute to fill out that form, um, you can support either by coming in person or through social media. Also, the Block Corporate Salmon um, hashtag is also an Instagram account. Now, I'll let you explain, Yasmin. Sure. Thank you, Heather. Um, so yeah, there's there's so much stuff um, going around um, to, or there's so many efforts to to stop the release of genetically engineered salmon, kind of coming from all sorts of angles, from like litigation um, and um, activism and what UNR is sort of offering, um, or our intentions kind of around this is to work with um, folks to, to organize or take coordinated direct action. And so our, our approach in this is kind of taking um, direct action to stop the release of genetically engineered salmon. Um, and we have folks who we've been organizing with, I can say the locations again, um, uh, which are Washington, California, Massachusetts, New York, Indiana, and Indiana is actually where the facility is, um, and Florida. Um, and so these are kind of the main locations in which we're seeking to host um, actions, which will hopefully include a lot of art, um, like Heather said, potentially murals, um, picketing, gathering, um, making a lot of noise uh, to let Aqua Bounty know that we do not want uh, their genetically engineered salmon. Um, we will not accept or buy their genetically engineered salmon, that um, we have purchasing power, that we have community power, um, and that this is not something that we are consenting to. This is not something that we are okay with. Um, it is happening very soon. All of the actions that we are coordinating, they're set to happen around mid-October. So please, be, please fill out that form now or as soon as you can. We will make sure to reach out to you. There are so many things that we need um, and so many skills we are looking for from folks. If you have graphic design skills, if you have um, press contacts, if you're interested in planning logistics, um, these are all things that we need. Um, if you, if you're interested too in um, like building relationships and um, like organizing healing spaces um, to stop like burnout, like those are all needs that we have um, in organizing these actions. And so we would appreciate um, all of these. If you have capacity and energy um, whatsoever, we would absolutely love to hear from you. Um, we'll, we'll figure out or we'll do the work on our end to figure out what roles um, folks can fit into. Um, so yeah, please absolutely um, fill out those forms, even if you're not from the locations that I mentioned. Uh, social media, like Heather said, is a huge part of this campaign. And so um, we would absolutely still love your help um, spreading the word um, and letting Aqua Bounty know. Um, and we are, we're really, again, so excited and so grateful to be working with folks um, and to be connecting with folks ac across the country to be organizing around this. Um, and we hope that a lot of these actions, these direct actions can be loud, but also um, healing for each other, um, especially now during the pandemic when that feels so needed. Um, one of the sort of philosophies or that UNR uses or the frameworks that UNR uses is block, build, be. Um, blocking the bad, building the good, and also being in our healing. And I think all three um, are equally important. Um, and that's an approach that we are trying to take, I think, in UNR is to both um, block Aqua Bounty from releasing GE Salmon, but also building up our community relationships too and working and listening to one another um, and also taking that time away as well to take care of ourselves. Um, so that is something that I think um, we are looking forward to building with folks uh, that are interested in joining and the folks that have been doing this work for uh, years and years and years. Um, but yeah, I think that's um, all I have to say on it. Please fill out the form and we'll reach out to you. Looks like at least 11 people have just filled it out. So we would love 
to see a few more of those. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and I also just want to share that um, Community Alliance for Global Justice will continue to provide ways to plug into this work. We're committed to it long term. And um, one opportunity that's coming up is our, I don't know if you can see me. Can you? No, because we have the slide up. I just, if you wouldn't mind um, unsharing that, I just want to share this poster or sharing the, anyway, <laughs> October 17th, we're having our annual SLEE Gala, which here's the poster. It's usually a big dinner for over 300 people, but of course this year it's a virtual gala and it'll be from 6 to 7 p.m. and it's meant to just for folks to be in community with one another, um, but also it's an opportunity to uplift the work that we're doing. And we'll be asking folks to take action on GE Salmon that evening. Um, so it's also a really important fundraiser for us. So uh, we'll send you all information about, but hope we can join, you can join us in our virtual gala from 6 to 7 p.m. Um, on October 17th. And the keynote will be by um, Chef Tariq Abdullah, who is an amazing organizer with um, youth doing food justice work in Seattle. And right now they're responding to the pandemic um, by preparing healthy food um, in the Central District for anybody who needs it. So really important work that we'll be uplifting on October 17th. Um, so it's time to wrap up. This has been a great uh, hour with you all. We really appreciate your time with us tonight. Thank you so much. And like I said, this is being recorded. We will send you all the recording so that you can share it out and all the relevant links to get involved and take action. Um, a special thank you to Yasmin and Valerie, also to Noelle and Sarah for all your coordination work. Um, and of course, to President Sharp, uh, amazing leadership here in the Northwest. So thanks also to the folks, uh, hanging on until 10 30 east coast time appreciate you all take care everybody thank you for coming everyone good night thanks all the rise up summer school participants who are here yeah good night val love you <laughs>